Belcha and welcome. My name is Dawn Beaton. Thanks for joining us here at the Centre for Cape Breton Studies at Cape Breton University. We're excited this week to welcome Kimberly Fraser. Kimberly was born on Cape Breton Island and nurtured within its rich musical heritage. She first began to impress audiences at the age of three with her step dancing talents. Soon after that, she took up the fiddle and the piano. She has traveled the world from Victoria to Afghanistan, bringing Cape Breton music with her wherever she goes. Kimberly holds a degree in violin performance from Berklee College of Music and in Celtic studies from St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia. Education is important to her, reflected in Kimberly's dedication to teaching Cape Breton music both at home and abroad. So stay tuned for some great tunes, conversation, and more as we celebrate Cape Breton Island's living Celtic culture. Thank you for joining us. My name is Don Beaton, and we're here today with the lovely and accomplished musician Kimberly Fraser. Hi, Kimberly. Hello, Don. How are you doing? I'm doing great this morning. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Good. How's everything fiddle-wise in your life? Oh, it's going. And I guess we're just digging out of the snow, <laughs> getting some spring. Yeah. Um, Good for practicing this all the stuff. Yeah, staying indoors and <laughs> learning some new tunes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, mostly teaching these days. Not doing a ton of traveling. I suppose this winter, no one's been doing it. But you've been busy too. You, speaking of traveling, though, you've you've done some big traveling over the pond to the other side there in right. Scotland. Yeah, uh, I was over in January to Celtic Connections. Um, I was with there with Howie McDonald and Dwayne Cote, mm -hmm. which was really nice because uh, really it was the first time I had spent any time with them in a traveling context, which was kind of fun. <laughs> um, and good to play with them too. You know, they're people that, of course, I had idolized my whole life mm -hmm. and had all the Howie records in the car and Dwayne recordings and things and I uh, saw them growing up at different, different concerts and uh, it was really cool to get to play with with people like that who you had idolized your your whole life so right on yeah. that sounds like a really good trip yeah. was there any did you get to see any other performances while you were over there it was a pretty tight trip and um, we were only there maybe for about f four days I think and um, so we I'm trying to think if I actually saw I can't remember <laughs> I know there's lots of rehearsals and sound checks and there and was a lot like of rehearsals for that. Yeah, we were over to do a concert for Keolis, mm -hmm. which is the music camp on uh, South Uist, and uh, we had uh, some some rehearsals to do for that, which kept us uh, quite busy. And then we actually ended up doing a last minute gig over there for the festival um, on one of the nights. So um, I think I was gonna go try and see another act that night, but that didn't work out because we ended up playing. Um, I did get to see, actually, uh, I got to see the great um, Quebecois group de Tom Santon, mm -hmm. if I said that correctly. I feel like I never do. <laughs> uh, Andre Brunet and Eric Boudry and uh, Pierre-Luc Dupuis. Yes. Um, and uh, they're one of my favorite bands. So I got to catch them over there, which was really fun. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was about it that I got Strong to see. Strong Canadian presence, which is great. Yeah. It's always nice to see. Lots yeah. of connections, of course, at Celtic Connections. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you were mentioning teaching, you're going to do some teaching this uh, summer perhaps? Yes, I'll be doing a little traveling, uh, going to some music camps, um, one in Asheville, North Carolina, oh, at fantastic. Uh, the Swan Noah Gathering, yeah. which is one of my favorite places to go, it's a lot of fun, uh, the Celtic week there, mm -hmm. and uh, then in August uh, I'm doing two weeks out in Saskatchewan mm. at uh, the Kenosi uh, fiddle camp. Uh, I hope I said that correctly. Uh, so I'm going to be my first time out to Saskatchewan. So I'm really excited about that and get to play with some people who I've really never met before. So right on. And those camps are great for that. That either reconnecting or meeting new, new people in the industry from virtually all over. Certainly North America, if not beyond. Oh, it's fantastic, and you get to spend five days with them, five or six days with them. So right. you really get to know people and create new friendships and uh, it's it's great to return to for sure yeah. yeah well I like to think that we we also accomplished that at Celtic Colors which is uh, you know a bit of a homecoming of sorts for many 
uh, both local and, and visiting musicians. Um, so tell me about your year last year, um, 2013, and, and your role in particular with the festival. Ah, well, last year uh, I was artist in residence, and you know, when I think back on last year, sometimes I ask myself, did that really happen? <laughs> because it was so incredible in so many ways. Um, when I think about who I was able to play with and work with um, in these various projects that I was doing, it's just incredible to think about. Um, so the main project that I had done last year was a show called String Crossings. Mm -hmm. And the, the concept of the show was to show how um, strings can accompany other stringed instruments. So we had, uh, of course, violins and violas. Actually, well, five strings. Actually, no, we did have one viola mm -hmm. and a couple of five string violins yes. um, and two cellos <laughs> and an upright bass, which was so cool to have on one stage. Um, and of course, we had three major styles represented in the show. We had the Cape Breton and Celtic and uh, the Scandinavian Nordic stuff and uh, American roots music. Mm -hmm. um, so the show was to kind of weave those things and then just to show how uh, string accompaniment can work. Uh, so that was a big project and it was just filled with fantastic, fantastic players. Gosh, we had um, Kyle McNeil from mm -hmm. the Bears, who mm -hmm. was my first teacher, which yeah. was very special for me. And uh, we had Harold, I can know, Halgard. Yes. I should know how to say his last name by now. <laughs> <laughs> known him for years but um so we had Harold who was the other artist in residence which was a great experience in itself in itself to work with him yeah. for the week and then prior to that um and then uh, we had um, the Nordic fiddlers block uh, Kevin Henderson and uh, Anders Hall and Olaf and I can never say his last name either. Do you remember? I don't want to attempt the. I yet. know. We're all, Olaf from Norway. Hi, Olaf. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the Americans. We had Natalie and Brittany Haas mm -hmm. and Daryl Anger, who was another one of my teachers uh, who I had at Berkeley College of Music. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really special to have him there too. Um, and uh, Jamie Gaddy on bass. Did I miss anybody? And Christine, Harold's cello, cello player. Yeah. Um, so it was a real interesting and amazing mix of s string players. And uh, I think that showed through in the music at night. And as far as the arrangements go, who did all that? Uh, well, um, I, I, I did. I wrote two, like I actually scored out two of the arrangements. One that I had done at school mm -hmm. at Berkeley and then a new one that I had written for that show. And yeah. um, I did a, a string arrangement of The Sweetness of Mary, that's Drass Bay. Mm. Um, but as far as the rest of the arranging, uh, I kind of just suggested a few things, a few tunes that I thought it would work for everybody to play on. And it was the, the types of players that those guys are, they're all so amazing at improvisation and being able to take things and shape them. Um, so I try to think of tunes in the Cape Breton repertoire that would lend itself to that, to ar arranging um, kind of to allow for Im improvisation and to yes. not have a lot of things planned for that. Um, but of course, you know, we had lots of suggestions from the group as well. Harold had a couple of his own compositions in there. I think uh, Anders had one of his tunes. Um, I kind of let the cellists do their own thing. They did a lovely duet in the show. So I had ideas for people what I thought might work. Um, and I had a few tunes suggestions, but we also had lots of suggestions from the group as well and their own their own compositions. Um, so it was kind of a mix, a mix of, of, of that, I think, which would, which lended itself really well to the types of players that those guys are. They're just amazing. So they can take an idea and just run with it. Yeah. So it was really great. And what was so great too for us is that we, we live recorded that show and we included it on our on our live compilation CD, which was a first for us last year right. to include. So um, there was you know, such strong material that came out of that and it was a real credit to both yourself and Harold for, for what you were able to accomplish in it and just fulfill that artist in residence role to oh, perfection. It was, really, it was really great to be included on that record and so yeah, well thanks for 
including that piece. <laughs> now, you've been involved with the festival for years. You've been in, in many uh, versions of it. Is there a favorite Celtic Colors memory that you could uh, recall at the moment? I don't know if I have an abs- like, uh, one particular favorite, but um, it's interesting to look back at those years, like at the years of Celtic Colors. And I think my first year was playing in 2000. And kind of looking at the player I was then, and then just looking at how th- those experiences at Celtic Colors, meeting all these international artists um, and getting to play with them, having that experience has really, I think, contributed to the player that I am now. Mm. And, you know, Celtic Colors actually led me to a lot of things. Actually, I, I don't know if I would have gone to Berkeley had really? it not been for that festival because you meet so many people you get exposed to so many different styles of music and it really sparks your interest for wanting to do new things, being inspired by all these pe- people. Um, mm. So I, th- I think it was, you know, a real huge factor in me wanting to go explore new things yeah. and go to school to do that. And that's so. that's quite the place to go and further your music instruction at Berkeley. I mean, not a lot of people from here probably get to do that. I mean, what was, is it four years? Is it? It, it, it can be. They have a four-year degree program and a two-year diploma program, and mm. I think they've just introduced a master's program abroad. Mm. Um, so I, since I had already had an arts degree from St. of X, I cut off I, one year there. Um, so I was there for three years and mm. came out with the uh, Bachelor of Music in Performance. Right. So, yeah. And you got to spend a lot of time in Boston and, and yeah. connect with the music scene there, which is equally as vibrant. And Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's, again, you're exposed to so much, so many different styles of music, and you run across just the best of the best in all of those different styles. Um, and at the school as well, um, just how you could, how I was able to network with certain people. It's how I met Daryl and how I was able to spend time with Brittany Brittany and Natalie. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, you know, I don't, well, I guess the string crossing show probably wouldn't have happened, at least on my part, had I not gone there and and was uh, exposed to those, uh, or getting to spend time with those people and getting exposed to different ways of approaching string uh, string playing yeah um so yeah being in boston being at berkeley was just a, a great experience in just so many ways i don't know if i can really put it into words to be honest but. i'm so glad that you also came back home and are, are here for uh living here in cape yeah. breton and so it means a lot that you've had those experiences you've done that you've seen various parts of the world but you've come back and are contributing back here to the music scene, yeah, so I'm really a lot. Quite, yeah, I'm happy to be back, um, and uh, I think, I mean, I always loved living here, but when you come back home from somewhere, I loved Boston too, I miss it, but um, yeah. when you come back, I think you appreciate home so much more, and the musicians here, and realize how special the music is here, mm. and how amazing the musicians are here, and um, yeah, it's really, really uh, special. To, to be back home and uh, um, teaching and, and playing local things again. And yeah, I, I, I kind of realized how much I missed it after, almost after I came back home. <laughs> I realized how much you appreciate and miss it um, after been away and having come back. So yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, well, speaking of which, I would love to hear some, some tunes and yeah. get that fiddle warmed up. And <laughs> so yeah, if you'd be up for playing tunes, that'd be great. Yes, I'll give it a hook. <laughs> Thank you. 
keep up with Kimberly's busy schedule at KimberlyFraser.com and learn more about her online lessons at KimberlySessions.com. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our partner in the production of this podcast, Cape Breton University. Imagine studying music on a beautiful island known for its deep roots in music and culture. Cape Breton University offers a music program like no other in Canada. With an emphasis on traditional and popular music, CBU's music major provides an exciting alternative to conservatory-style classical or jazz music programs. Their course offerings are unique. The music theory courses are aimed at the needs of contemporary musicians and help you understand the music you play. In the applied music courses, you get to study with teachers who have worked with names like the Bear McNeils, Ashley McIsaac, and Natalie McMaster. Through work placements, you will gain experience in the music field tailored to your interests, whether it's studio experience, promotion, tourism, or artist management. Through the optional business minor, you can add smart, real-world management skills to the creative talent you develop. The ethnomusicology focus lets you explore local traditions, popular song, as well as music and dance from cultures all over the world. Their issues-based courses will immerse you in the debates that shape music today. Cape Breton Island has magical effects. Your ears will delight. Your legs will walk through time. Your eyes will fill with wonder. Your arms will embrace. Your heart will never leave. Oh, that was great. Thanks for the tunes. Oh, the thanks. minor set, right? It's a little nerve-wracking playing first thing in the morning <laughs> all by yourself <laughs> with lots of lights. and <laughs> That was fun. You know. Oh, you're always, you always play just to perfection. Oh, it's great. A little scratchy sometimes. <laughs> Most of the time. So those fiddles, you know, they're... Oh, speaking of which, you have a Clay Carmichael fiddle That's as well. Right. yep. We've had the Clay Carmichael Club on here. Um, and you play a left-handed fiddle, correct? Yes. Yep. So it's a, uh, it was kind of specially made for you then. Yeah, and it was actually the second left-handed one that he made. Really? Yep. Um, so yeah, I got ma- he made this in 94, so it's nearly 20 years old. Wow. Um, yeah, we just had a gathering act, actually. Uh, we were celebrating um, Clay and Kathy's wedding a- anniversary, and uh, there's a bunch of us at um, his son's house, and... Uh, and uh, this was one of the older, this was one of the senior ones of the group. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, so it's it's neat to think back, actually. It, it still feels new. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty near 20 years old now. Well, yeah. right on. Yep. So uh, you were mentioning Berkeley before and, and teaching. Um, so I think what's great about you, too, uh, is that you're advancing... The, the medium in which we we conduct lessons and, and you've done something really interesting with the online world. Maybe right. you could elaborate with your sure. your online presence. <laughs> sure. Um, in 2011, I started an online business for teaching called KimberlySessions.com. Mm. So I started with the fiddle and uh, I filmed a, uh, about 104 lessons so far uh, wow. in, in, in total. Um, there's two different levels, kind of like an advanced beginner level mm-hmm. with appropriate tunes and then an advanced level. Um, so there's a year's worth of lessons in each course right now, and I'm currently adding to that. Uh, and then later on, I started a piano workshop that was a little more interactive, where it was kind of like a, a six week course done over 12 weeks. Mm-hmm. And uh, students would send me recordings of themselves with the material and I would kind of send back a critique of that and um, right. so that's how, kind of how the piano one works right now mm. um, but at the moment I'm actually reconstructing the site and uh, just to allow for uh, more content and just to let things run just a little bit better so uh, as we speak I'm kind of redoing that and uh, filming new stuff and planning um, more lessons and adding to the piano course and we'll see where it en- ends up. I try to blog on there too. I haven't blogged for a while, um, but um, 
I was pretty good there for a bit, trying to churn out a couple a week. Uh, but just about uh, practicing and just thoughts on teaching Cape Breton music. And, I, I liked it because, especially, you know, if you're not a learner specifically, just a discussion of the technique or what makes Cape Breton music unique or... Um, certain elements of like the Strass Bay and, and deconstructing that, which I thought was really interesting to go back and it's all still there that you can go back and look at it. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. right? yeah. Yeah, just talking about the rhythmic aspect of a Strass Bay and it's something that I think as Cape Breton fiddle players we just take for granted. We play Strass Bays, we, we inherently understand how they work and they're dotted and yeah. we know how to uh, put the, the dots and the flags in the right spots, you know, and if we want to change a rhythm here and there it's not a big deal, but um, Strass Bays are actually, you know, especially for a learner, for somebody who's not from Cape Breton, um, they're one of, I think, the hardest tune types to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, just because there's just a very specific timing you have to have with them, you have to be able to play for dancing. Mm -hmm. There are slow Strass Bays too. Um, they're, they're difficult if you're not used to listening to them all the time, it's difficult to transition into a Strass Bay and out of a Strass Bay into a mm -hmm. reel or from a merch or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's things like that that we take for granted because we just, we hear it all the time. We know how to do that for somebody coming from outside the style. Um, it, those things can be re really challenging. So I like to kind of talk about those types of things and tearing the rhythm apart and um, even down to the foot tapping, that's something we take for granted too. It's something that we uh, we do naturally. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's things I start to think about too. Then I'll start to watch everybody's foot tapping <laughs> and see does everybody do it? Oh, heel there's toe. Many, there's and many variations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one foot, both feet. Yes. Everything. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. And even I get questions about, you know, do I have to tap my foot? Is that going to make my playing mm. better? And again, it's things that I've never thought about before. But if you're coming from it from outside of uh, um, the style, then, you know, I guess you would wonder things like that. Um, so I, I think I actually wrote a blog on foot tapping, actually. I think that's really important. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, things that I would never think of. I got asked a lot of questions, and uh, yeah, so it, the blog almost helps me think about things that and formulate things uh, to incorporate in my teaching too. No, well, it's a good so, discussion to be having, yeah. um, and what a form to be having it on. Favorite type of tune while we're at it? Strass Bay Real March. Favorite Polka? type of tune? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play too many of those. <laughs> um, I, don't, I actually, you know what, I love, I mean, I love playing dance music for sure. And there's mm -hmm. nothing like playing for a dance. And uh, it's actually interesting when you don't play a dance for a while. I find my timing sometimes can suffer a little bit <laughs> just by not having that constant rhythm there and, and playing for that type of t timing. Um, so jigs, reels, strass bays, of course, I love to, to play. But I actually really love playing slow airs. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. it shows too because yeah. you've got such a it, the technique that you embody too. Really, oh. you speak the language oh. well. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. Um, but yeah, I, I really love playing uh, slow airs and just really getting lots of range out of my bow and um, taking liberty with them. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily have to play them in time. Yeah, um, especially when you're playing by yourself. You yeah, know, if I get the opportunity to play in a beautiful structure, especially like a church. I love um, doing that too. Yeah. Go to a church when no one else is there mm -hmm. and just uh, let, let it ring. ring. And you do things, I think, in the moment of that that you probably wouldn't do otherwise. It just inspires you in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I love to play in a church and play a lovely slow air whenever I get the chance to. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a certain uh, process for learning new tunes? Do you, do you sit down with, with books or do you listen up to a lot of recordings or YouTube these days? <laughs> yeah, um, I was, I feel like I should be more of a book person and there's times I feel guilty for not being more of a book person and digging into books. Um, I read fine, but I, I don't retain tunes as well when, it takes me longer to retain um, them when I read them, especially if I haven't heard them before. Um, right. So. I, I feel like I'm more of an ear learner and what I like to do is put a, a I'm still into the CDs. I haven't really quite crossed over into the age of iPods <laughs> and and uh, to plug an iPod into my car and put it on shuffle just doesn't work for me. I, I like to put 
a certain CD in and have it in the car for a long time mm -hmm. and listen to it until I've learned it for the most part. Yeah. Um, that's what I enjoy. And, you know, I'll take a half hour trip sometimes and keep listening to the same track. Really? <laughs> Just because, you know, I like it or um, there's a specific tune in there I want to learn or Mm -hmm. So a lot of my learning happens when I'm driving. Yeah. Um, and actually, I noticed when I lived in Boston, I didn't have a car. And I walked everywhere. And I wasn't, again, into having earbuds in my ears and walking at the same time. I found that challenging. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I missed actually driving. And I mm. spent five years not driving a car. Wow. And that I didn't learn as many tunes. And I didn't realize mm. that until I got home and bought a car and started driving around here and uh, started learning a lot more tunes just by having music on in the car and listening and um yeah so i guess i learned my tunes mostly by listening and uh almost reminding myself again of tunes that i forgot about yeah like I put on old i think it records. kind of seeps into your brain in a different way and, and i always tell my students that i like playing the tune out on the steering wheel it's great for strength yes. strengthening the fingers a little bit and yeah. trying out some technique that's right yeah it's yeah. a great you may as well do something well i mean we're safe drivers we should just say that we're concentrating <laughs> on the task at hand but that's a good point actually um yeah i shouldn't be distracted too much by listening to stuff or getting a speeding ticket for trying to figure out the tune and you don't realize that you're going 120 yeah those <laughs> yeah. really good juicy tunes and you're just in the moment the fast one, especially the pipe tunes if yeah. there's um if i have a good pipe track on that's blasting and um yeah, it's easy to, to not focus on how fast you're going until you see maybe the cops come on the other way. Good excuse for the cops, yeah. maybe. maybe. Uh, yeah, I haven't tried. Well, I, I haven't, haven't tried it either. Right yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try that though next time. Yeah. Hopefully there won't be next time. How about that? Yeah, there exactly. There won't be any time. I don't speak. No. <laughs> um, I did want to ask too, what's, what's it, uh, where did the music come from in your life? Were you surrounded by growing up? Did you, do your parents play? What's, what's the story? Uh, well, my sister, I think I initially became exposed to it through my sister because she was a step dancer. Um, she took lessons from Jean McNeil hmm. and at Jean's recitals at the end of the year, uh, the Barrows would play for that. And she would also have Carl McKenzie play and Hilda Chesson. I remember Brenda Stubbert, Doug McPhee. Um, wow. So I remember those quite vividly, even at two and three years old. Um, so I started going to her her concerts. Mm. Um, and uh, actually, when uh, there was, <laughs> when she, I think she was about 14, I was about two, and they called out her name to dance, and I just booted it right up on the stage. Really? As soon as I called out her name, I went, and my mom addressed me, not knowing I was going to be on the stage, <laughs> but I had on my little Nova Scotia tartan skirt. <laughs> And um, I I danced with her. I just had the little foot uh, bobbing along in time. Like there's a video of it actually. We can see the foot going in time. And uh, the next year, so I learned a few steps actually from my sister uh, when I was small. And then the next year I did a solo uh, at the recital. And then I started taking step dancing lessons from Jean when I was about four. Mm. Um, but uh, so that I think that was my initial exposure to things. and when uh or at my on my both sides of my family there are fiddle players my my mom's father played the fiddle and the accordion and dabbled in different things and i actually i have my great great grandfather's violin so his grandfather's oh. violin i have that there's four of his that i have um two of them are quite old and uh yeah uh so he he, he played the violin and then on my dad's side, um, there are step dancers and fiddle players too. Mm -hmm. I never really, of course, I never got to see any of them play. Um, but so it wasn't really, I didn't quite grow up with the music in my immediate family, only through my sister's step dancing. Mm -hmm. um, but there were always lots of recordings on in, in the house and in the car. And yeah. uh, at that time, it seemed to be on television a lot too. Mm -hmm. um, Up Home Tonight was on every week. And yep, get I miss it. Yeah, I miss it a lot. Uh, so I would get to see, you know, the Rankins and the Bear McNeils and Ashley McIsaac. And yeah. when they were very, uh, actually, uh, when Ashley was on, I told my mother that I was going to marry him because he was left-handed and I thought we were oh. meant to be. <laughs> 
so I was all about six at that point. And that's when my mother thought, well, maybe I should put her in fiddle. Oh, my God. That's so great. Yeah. Does Ashley know this story? He does. does uh, yeah, he? I told, I, when, uh, you know, for years, of course, I didn't see him because he was always, uh, at that point, he was traveling a lot and he wasn't around a lot. And mm. But when I finally had the chance to see him, I said, oh, my God, Ashley, you're the reason I played the fiddle. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's so great. Well, thank God for things like Up Home Tonight and, mm-hmm. and that presence, and certainly like the Kaylee and all those programs. Uh, and Donnie's on on radio. Yes. That means so much to hear that and be kind of reinforced by it. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, we can keep those resources going. Yeah. And on a side note, I've definitely done the been dressed up in the tartan as well <laughs> at a very young age. So we have that in common. <laughs> Yes, um, I think we should start a new trend again. Yeah. Perhaps we could, should go out in our tartan skirts and our sure. pants and everything. Yeah. We'll get Veronica McIsaac to do up uh, an outfit That's for right. us and support local. Yes. Well, I appreciate you coming in. Thanks so much oh, for chatting and, and, so much fun. and giving us some great tunes. It means a lot. Oh, well, thanks for having me. And it's great fun to chat. So great to see you as, al- as always. As too. always with yep. you, too. Thanks so much, Kimberly. Thanks. And uh, thank you for joining us today. We're going to uh, show a clip of the wonderful Gaelic speaking and uh, Gaelic singing culture bear, Willie Frazier. Willie is a singer, storyteller, and renowned dancer. Raised in Inverness County, an area well known for its vibrant Gaelic heritage, Willie has had a lifelong passion for the music of Gaelic Cape Breton. Here, Willie tells us the story of the step dancing teacher who came to him in his dreams. Well, my name is William Francis Fraser from Deepdale. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wasn't born there. I was born in St. Rose, down St. Rose. And um, my father and my mother, they had 10 of a family, five girls and five boys. And just around the same time, the mine in Inverness started up working pretty well. And uh, he, he moved into Inverness town. The town was just coming up then, and he, he worked in the mine for quite a while. And uh, at our place, there was quite a little bit of music all the time. My father could play. And my brother could play, Neil, two of them could play. We had quite a bit of music, they weren't the best, but they could put me out on the floor to step dance. So I used to watch my father dancing, and he had five or six nice steps. And this night, I went to bed, and I fell asleep, of course. And this fellow walked into my room. And he spoke, well, I didn't, I was asleep. And he said, you're going to be a dancer, a step dancer. He said, not a tap dancer, or anything like that. It's real steps, step by step. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you five steps. And you'll try and learn those five steps tomorrow or any time. So, all right, this is a long time ago. So I came downstairs, my father asked me, how did you dance last night, Willie Francis? Well, I just ta- tell you about this fellow walking into my bedroom, and he told me, you're going to be a dancer, so I'm going to show you four or five steps right now. So he jumped out on the floor right in the bedroom. That was, of course, I was sound asleep, but it's a dream. And he showed me about five or six nice steps. So I come down in the morning. My father asked me, Oh, did you sleep last night, Willie Francis? Well, I'll just tell you, I slept good, but there was a fellow walked in my room. And he said, You're going to be a dancer. And I'm going to show you five steps. And I said, OK. Well, he said, If I take the violin and play a tune for you, do you think you can show me them five steps that he made for you last night? Oh, sure, I said, nothing to it. I was only six or seven, kind of, kind of foolish anyway then, you know. 
So I went out on the floor and I made those five steps. With these five and the five that I dreamt of, I had ten steps then. So two weeks later, this I went to, to bed and the same fellow walked in the room and he said, you're going to uh, be a dancer all right, he said. I'm going to show you five more steps, mm -hmm. five more steps right now and try and learn them. So he went out on the floor, I guess over here, this downstairs, but I wasn't hearing anything but just this here. Went downstairs in the morning, my father asked me, did you sleep good last night, Willie Francis? Yes, I did, but the same fellow was just out in front of me on the floor showing me more steps. Good steps, too. Well, okay, he said, I'm going to take the violin. Do you think you'll do them steps for me now? You didn't have too much time from last night until now. Well, I can do them. So anyway, he took the violin, he started playing the violin, playing the tone for me, and oh, I was going right through the whole thing. Then I had 15 steps, all good steps. So that's all right. That went on, going every couple of weeks, every two weeks, and until I learned about 40 steps from this fellow here, all good steps. And then after that, well, I do the, the dream and quit. I, uh, I was on my own then. Every place I'd go, there'd be old fellas there at that time. They used to have good steps too, and if, that, if they had one good one that I'd like, I'd just watch this kind of close to the floor, and I'd learn that step. 